Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, September the 2nd, 2022. It is currently 1247 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central Studios located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, right here next to me is my iPad. I'm looking at two apps right now, two apps that stand out. I have the Edify Christian Podcast app, which supposedly has like 2 million Christian podcasts. And obviously it has hundreds and thousands of sermons from churches all across the United States of America and the world. The Edify Christian Podcast app, I have it right here. If I just open it up, let's just see some things that that jumps out at me really quick. I'm just going to go to where it says my subscriptions, right? Okay. Okay. Immediately, here's what I see. Um, Here is one. Is this hindering another spiritual awakening in crazy America? That sounds interesting. What is supposedly hindering another spiritual awakening in crazy America? That sounds like something we need to review. Okay, all right. But then I have Christ glorified in his pre-existence. Now, that's a sermon. Christ glorified in his pre-existence. There's a sermon. Oh, I have here gospel-centered change. That's a sermon. I have another one. 1 Corinthians 11, part C. That's a sermon. So just right there, just going to my subscriptions, those are all brand new sermons that have dropped in probably the last 10 to 15 minutes, just right there on the Edify Christian Podcast app. If I open up the Sermons 2.0 app, the Sermons 2.0 app, and if I look right now, if I go to, well, I could hit Discover, right? I'm just going to go to Newest Sermons, Newest Sermons, right now available on the uh, Sermons 2.0 app, if I just go there. So on the Edify Christian Podcast app, just in the last few minutes, a few new sermons have dropped from different churches around the country. If I go to the uh, Sermons 2.0 app, I mean, Divine Care Displayed, The Unloved Messianic Line, A Tale of Two Traitors, The Mock Trial of Jesus, Eye for an Eye, Psalm 2, Part 1, Go and Learn, A Faltering Faith, Judgment Coming on Corrupt Leaders, The Wisdom of Keeping the Ox, Home Sweet Home. I mean, there is sermon after 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 sermon. sermon, All right. So there's not a lack of preaching. Everyone can agree there is so much preaching available to every individual who has a phone or a tablet just with an internet connection. Hundreds of thousands, millions of sermons available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So so there's no question. It's not like there's a famine from hearing the preaching of God's word. There is so much. Now, you could argue about the quality of that preaching, but we'll get to that in a minute. Just from a very just basic level, there's not a lack of preaching There is plenty of preaching. And then if I don't know about where you live, but I live here in West Texas, obviously the Theology Central Studios are located in Abilene, Texas. There are churches on every corner. I think in some corners, there's two or three churches, right? There's churches everywhere. We're a city of what, about 109,000 people, maybe 110. Maybe it's up to 120,000 now. Haven't looked at the city limits sign to see the population recently. But let's say 120,000. We have three Christian universities. We have a Baptist, Hardin-Simmons. We have a Methodist, a McMurray University. And we have the Church of Christ, Abilene Christian University. Three Christian universities, churches literally everywhere. So there's plenty of preaching available here in Abilene, Texas, and wherever you live. There are churches, I'm assuming, everywhere. There's probably plenty where you live. You may live in an area where there's not as many as here as in West Texas, but I'm sure there are plenty. So churches are available everywhere. There are millions of sermons available online. So there's plenty of preaching and teaching the Bible. But you know that I have constantly question the, the, how can I say, 
the what we're actually accomplishing. Like for me, so many times I look at all the churches, I, I see all the sermons, I see all the preaching, and there's a part of me that wants to say, meaningless, 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 it's all meaningless. Now, I know that's a very fleshly human way of looking at it, but I'm just going to be honest with you, right? I, I can drive past a hundred churches, right? And then you, and, and then you like, so all these people went into those churches, they all walked out, did it make any difference? Does anyone even remember what was preached? And then you hear studies that typically for most churchgoers, what is preached Sunday morning is basically almost completely forgotten by Sunday evening. I mean, there and, and by Wednesday, it's almost completely gone. And by next Sunday, it's, it's basically whatever was done last week doesn't even matter anymore. Just repeat the process. Now, if, if we're preaching and it's forgotten literally maybe the same day, then what, I mean, what are we doing? What are we doing? It, does any of it really matter? So I've called that into question plenty. So there's not a lack of preaching, but it doesn't seem to be doing much. It, it doesn't seem to be retained. That's a fact. What do we do about that? Now, Listen, by no means, because we always have new people listening to this podcast. I am no way saying, well, throw out preaching and throw out the church because I believe there's biblical mandates, obviously, for the church and for preaching, right? Preaching is what God calls us to do. So I, by no means am I saying we shouldn't do it. I'm just trying to have a realistic look at all that is available and what is it really accomplishing, right? And so we can have that discussion and we could talk about it. But here's a question. And I don't know how far I'm going to get into this in this episode, all right? But, but you know, the, the danger of having your podcast studio basically in your home is whenever there's something you start thinking about, you're like, well, it's not like a radio program where I've got to wait till the next day where I have two or three hours. No, literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Whenever I'm thinking about something, I could just walk upstairs, turn on the microphone and talk to you about it. Some people love that. Some people would rather it, it would be more organized and put together, but I just like the very organic, real concept of I'm thinking about it, so let's talk about it. I, I kind of like that approach. And, and well, those who do, subscribe to the podcast, and those who don't, avoid it. I can understand. So I was downstairs, and this question came into my, my mind. And the reason this question came into my mind is because of an article that was published on August the 30th, 2022, at crossway.org. Right now, before I read the headline, before you even mention the article, this is the question that came to my mind. What is missing from today's preaching? What is the missing ingredient from today's preaching? Like if you were to grab a notebook and you were to write down three things you think are missing from from preaching today, what would you write down? Now, th now this has happened plenty of times in church history, right? You'll, there'll, there'll be a, like one kind of preaching that kind of dominates the church, and then there'll be a small minority going, no, 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 that's the wrong way to preach. You need to do it this way. And then everyone will be like, that's it. That's the key. If everyone preaches that way, then everyone will remember our sermons, and it's going to have profound impact. And, it's, and then everyone runs to that method. And then after a while, you realize no one was remembering those sermons either. Everyone thinks thinks that their little, their little ingredient, their little method is the right way. I mean, everyone thinks that. I don't care what kind of church you go to. They think their preaching is the right way. Everyone thinks that. So obviously, whatever missing ingredient we list, I don't know if it would really change anything, but it would be interesting from people sitting in the pew, not the people standing behind the pulpit, not the people sitting in front of a microphone doing a Christian podcast. No, no, no. The people sitting in the pew, the people sitting on their, in their, on their couch right now, the person driving their car, riding a city bus, wherever you may be, just the average lay person from your perspective, what do you think is missing in preaching? And, and, and I don't want you to give me, I don't want to go, I don't want you to go all ultra spiritual and I don't want you to, and I listen, and I don't want you to act like, you know, you've got to, you've got to say something that may not be what's really in your heart, in your heart. You've heard lots of sermons, probably thousands and thousands and thousands, depending how long you've been saved, depending on how many sermons you listen to on a, on a daily basis. Do you, I mean, how much of it do you retain? How much does it actually mean anything? How, how much does it actually, 
do anything for you. So from a very practical perspective for you personally, don't worry about, don't, don't think about anybody for you personally. What do you feel is missing in preaching today? What do you think is the missing ingredients? I want you to come up with three things or, or up to three things. You don't have to find three. I would like to get a list from people, three things they think are missing in today's preaching, three things. And, I, and I'm not having, I don't want you to bash your church. I don't want, I don't, it's not here to attack anyone or bash anyone. I just want you to like, what do you think is missing in today's preaching? Now, I review lots of sermons. I review countless sermons on this podcast. If you listen to this podcast, we're always reviewing sermons. We're, right now, we've been reviewing sermons preached at a youth conference in Indiana uh, about a month ago. And, oh, man. There, there, there's been some serious problems with those sermons, okay? But again, that's that's a preacher, Christian podcaster critique. The people sitting in the pew may think, these were the most amazing sermons ever, and I remember every word. How dare you criticize them? So I want to know from the person sitting in the pew, what do you think is missing in preaching today? What, what keeps you from retaining it? doing anything for you. I mean, like, are you sitting there painfully enduring it? What is your, I I like to hear the person in the pew explain it because so many times when they explain it from the preacher perspective or from the, you know, the minister perspective, you kind of look at the people going, what are you talking about? Like you kind of look at them going, I don't think I understand your criticism, but we need to hear the criticism. So from the people in the pew, what is the missing ingredients in preaching today? What what do you think they are? What do you think they are? Please email me your list uh, up to three. You don't have to put a total of three. You can put more if you want, but you know, one, two, three, what you think is missing. You can email that list to me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Now I have, you've heard my philosophy explained over and over and over in this podcast. I think so much that I think the problem in preaching is that in so many cases, everybody wants a sermon. They don't want to actually study the text. And I think in many cases, sermons actually keep people from the text. And I know that sounds counterintuitive. Like, no, they're preaching the text. I think in some, no, they've put together a sermon using a text. But in many cases, the sermon doesn't actually lead people into the text. It's just a sermon. And as long as it's organized nice and neat, got three points, and you get out in about 40 minutes, everyone loves it. But when it's said and done, what did you actually get from the text? Really, tell me what you got from the text. And they start talking like, no, 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 no. You're quoting the sermon. What did you get in the text? There's no actual study of the text. Now, I say that. And when you listen to the way I teach, it's very different than the most the, than the typical sermon structure. I've kind of abandoned the typical sermon structure because I'm like, no, I don't want to just write sermons. I want to have I want to have everyone studying the text. There is a difference. Now I don't know if the average person sitting in the pew agree with me that there's a difference, but I think there's a difference. And I've tried to point that out in some of our sermon reviews. I'm like, he didn't deal with the text. He, he has a point he wants to make. He's just using the text. It would have been better to say today, I'm going to talk about this and I'm not, and, and may not even quote a text. People say, how dare he do that? It's more honest than pretending that that text has anything to do with what he's, he's talking about. So what do you think is missing? What is the missing ingredient? Now, I don't think, well, I'll state this. So go ahead. So, all right. So let's do this. All right. Okay. Someone just said, Well, you just gave my answer. Too many sermons just using a verse or two to allow the preacher to make a point that he wants to make. Okay, so someone someone just said in in the in the chat that they they feel kind of the same way that it's not really the teaching of the text. It's just it's a sermon. It's a speech. It's a speech. I've got a speech. I've got a sermon. And then I'm going to find a text to connect to it because it's church. I got to connect a text to it. I got to. If I if I speak for 45 minutes and I don't quote a text, then it's going to be anathema, kill the preacher. But what what difference does it make if he quotes the text if it's not actually studying the text? Now, now my question is, though, maybe sometimes that would actually be better. I don't know. But I, I think if, you, if you're there to actually learn the text, I think in many cases you're going to walk away maybe frustrated or maybe not retain anything. So I want you to come up with one to three things that you think are missing from preaching today. But here is something. 
And this was not on my, this wasn't my original intent. But now that I'm thinking about it, I, I think it would not be fair to at least ask this question. What do you think is missing in the people listening to sermons that could result in them not retaining, getting anything from it, or doing anything with it? Because I think I think there's a re- there's clearly a responsibility from the pulpit to preach, I would hope, not first and foremost, being faithful to the Word of God and leading people to the Word of God, but I think preachers always have to be critiquing what we're doing and what is missing and what could we be doing better because all of the studies saying people are not retaining anything. They're not, they don't remember it. It doesn't matter. So, I mean, in reality, all the studies tell me that what I preach this Sunday, coming Sunday, is irrelevant because by next Sunday, no one's going to remember it. It's not going to accomplish one thing, at least from a human perspective. I understand there's something spiritual going on where God uses preaching and he does whatever he wants with it. But from a human perspective, I want you to know how discouraging that is from a preacher's perspective. Hey guys, I'm going to preach to you now, but let's all, come on, the game is up. Let's all be honest. You're not going to remember this. So it really doesn't matter what I say, right? Like, like, I know that's not the way you're supposed to do it, but but so when we're looking at the preacher's responsibility, though, but what is the what is missing in the people? Like, is there a missing ingredient in the way people listen to sermons, the way people approach Christian podcasts? I, I think in some cases people retain more from Christian podcasts than they do from a church service. That's a whole different subject. But what is missing in people? Because I think some people retain and remember. And some people don't. And I don't believe it has anything to do with an intelligence or ability. I think there's a response. There, if there's a responsibility from the pulpit, there's a response. There, what is missing in people that leads them not to retain and that it's all really just a waste of time? I think, I think, I think, I think some things that are missing. I don't, I think many cases people show, show up not prepared at all. They don't even do anything to help themselves be prepared. Either they, they don't, they, I mean, if people, if, I mean, some people can't operate if they don't get 37 hours of sleep in a 24 hour period, they're going to die. So, so, you know, maybe go to sleep earlier, maybe wake up a little earlier and actually, I don't know, have breakfast, maybe not be running behind. Like, I think there's some basic practical things that many people don't even bother to do to prepare themselves so that they're ready to hear God's word. So I, I think there's I think there may be ingredients missing in preaching, but I think there may be ingredients missing in people that creates a situation where there's there's big buildings, lots of money, budgets, activities. There's deacons, elders. There's there, there's all this big structure, and there's lots of sound. <laughs> there's lots of activity. But I don't know if there's really much more than that. Now, the article. Obviously, if they're writing an article, they think they've figured it out. They've got the magical formula. So I I would love to get your list of three things you think are missing in preaching and three things that you think may be missing inside people that leads to a just a total waste of time. I mean, look... This is not some mysterious thing. You can take two people, put them in the same classroom, public school setting, university setting, junior college, I don't care where, and two people hearing the exact same lesson taught the exact same way, and one person will walk out going, man, that was a great lesson. I learned this, and I learned this, and the other person is like, I didn't care. It was boring, whatever, and and, and they're like, wait, wait, what happened? Now, there, there may be something in the teacher, but there may be something in the individual's. Just, 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 just my thought. But let's see what they have to say. I don't know how far we're going to get into this, but we'll see. All right, we'll see if we can at least get to their answer. They say a missing ingredient in today's preaching. August 30th, 2022, crossway.org. A neglected aspect of expository preaching and Bible teaching. Now let's stop right here. Now this is interesting. So you can't say, well, they are not looking at what's missing is that people are not doing expository preaching. They are saying there's something missing from expository preaching. So they're now even narrowing it down. In other words, you can't say, we need more expository preaching. I hear that all the time, but I've, I've seen churches where there's expository. Exp- people still forget just the same way. Don't retain, don't remember. 
It, it just, we feel better because we're doing it in an expository way so everybody can pat ourselves on the back going, hey, we do expository preaching and they don't. We're better. So I, I, I've seen a little bit of that. But okay. In this article, they're, they're even referring to the expository preaching. This is what they go on to say. It has been a regular feature of my life. According, This is according to the author of this article that I'm reading. Not This is not me speaking. This is the article that I'm reading. It has been a regular feature of my life that when I chat with a preacher after a church service and commend his sermon, he tells me how much he has benefited from writings on the Bible as literature. Hmm. Now, I've, I've, I've heard preachers and I've thanked preachers for their sermons. I've never heard a preacher go, well, well, thank you for your compliment, but I have really, it just, it seems like a weird situation. So let's try to picture this. So, so a preacher is done preaching. You walk up to them and you're like, Hey, I want to commend you on your sermon. It was amazing. And the preacher's like, Hey, you just don't know how much I've benefited from writings on the Bible as literature. Uh, that that just seems an odd response. I don't think I've ever heard that. Re- well, thank you for your co- for your compliment, but I want you to know how much I have benefited from books that talk about the Bible as literature. Now, I think I, I know where they're going. So, what's missing from preaching? The missing agree- ingredient is that preachers don't preach the Bible as its literature. Is that the missing ingredient? Is that? Is that the new thing? Hey, guys, if we will preach the Bible like it's literature, boom, everything will be different. I, I, I just, there's always the new thing that's going to fix everything. Let's see if this makes any sense. Okay, I'm just trying, it's just, I just don't know how common it would be for a pastor to go, well, thank you for your compliment, but I want to tell you something. I have benefited from writings on the Bible as literature, right? Almost always, I listen in perplexity because in the sermon under discussion, I could detect no evidence of handling the Bible in keeping with its literary nature. The literary approach to the Bible that seemed to be endorsed with such enthusiasm three decades ago has resulted in lip service as conventional methods of handling the Bible have been misleadingly re-Christianed as a literary approach. So I guess supposedly three decades ago, the Bible was definitely handled as literature. But now when preachers say that it's just lip service, they don't even really mean it. It's not really showing up in the preaching. Now, I've been a Christian for a long time. I, I must have missed something. And I've listened to a lot of sermons. And I, there are other people listening right now. I know they've listened to a lot of sermons. They've visited churches. They've, they've listened to sermon audio. Did, did I miss the transition? Wow, I remember back in the day when the Bible was preached as literature. And then there was this crazy change. 1995, 2000, and then everyone just abandoned. I don't remember that. I don't, I don't remember when this happened. They go on to say, the literary approach to the Bible and the importance of genre as a chief ingredient of such an approach are subjects of neglect. This represents a missed opportunity of massive proportions and missed opportunities are always sad. My encouragement in the rest of this article is to show that we can remedy a sad situation with just a a modicum modicum of commitment in the right direction. It's easier than we think. Hmm. So we can fix everything. Just a little bit of commitment. We can remedy a sad situation. We can fix everything. It says we need to start our journey at the broadest possible level, not with a specific genres, but with the idea of the Bible as literature. Actually, this is an issue of genre, but in a somewhat disguised form. I remember what a moment of epiphany it was for me to read the title of the opening chapter of a book on literary genres. The chapter title was Literature as Genre. 
From the beginning of my scholarly career, I have operated on the premise that literature and mass has its own characterizing traits, but never thought of this as a genre. So in other words, like this was a big thing, like wait, literature itself is a genre. So I have to see then liter- liter- literature as a self as a genre, and then it has its own distinguishing characteristic traits. And somehow, if we add this into preaching, boom, we fix it because right now we're in a very sad, 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 sad situation because what's missing is preaching as literature and literature as a genre. That... I'm, I'm, I'm really, and this all, I guess, is based off a book called The Beauty and Power of Biblical Exposition. This book seeks to give pastors tools to better understand the literary nature of scripture in order to give sermons that, that are interesting, relevant, and accurate to the author's intention. So if we will see the Bible as literature, if we'll preach the literary nature of Scripture, our sermons will become interesting. They will become relevant. They will become accurate to the author's intention. Dun, 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 dun. Everything is fixed. So does your pastor preach the Bible as literature? Does it understand that literature has its own genre? It says, in the conduct of our daily lives, we encounter two main types of writing or discourses. One is expository or informational discourse. The other is literary discourse. 80% or more of the Bible falls into the category of literary discourse. But that is not how the Bible is characteristically handled and preached in our circles. Virtually every Bible teaching session and sermon treats the biblical passage in exact the same way with no attention to the specific genre of a passage. They're saying, so the problem is we handle every passage the exact same way. Now, I, I do agree a little bit with this truth. I think every passage, every chapter has its own unique characteristics and we have to handle it differently. When I was kind of doing the Bible Institute podcast and and tried to take that in a certain direction, as we were, quote unquote, I I try to really drive this illustration that we're journeying through the Bible. I tried to make it clear that every chapter had to be, had, had its own unique way of approaching it. And I think that's true. I think when you have to look at everything and go, wait, this is a little different. This is, this is, okay, pay attention to this. So I do believe we need to understand and identify the literary genre or literature as a genre, however you want to break that down. And I do believe every chapter does require a different approach. I do agree with that, but I don't know if that's the missing ingredient. Uh, it says, it says, and so what is this big genre in which the entire Bible is placed? It says, let, let me answer that indirectly by citing the formula of a writer on the parables named Kenneth Bailey, who bequeathed to me a formula that I've used in my teaching and writing ever since I encountered it. Bailey wrote that a parable and by extension, any literary text is not a delivery system for an idea. A delivery system for an idea, that is exactly how the Bible is characteristically handled. That's interesting. They're saying what the problem is, we view scripture as a delivery system for an idea. That that here's the system and it's going to deliver an idea, we figure out the idea. They're saying that that's not the way to handle it. It says, by contrast, the chief subject of literature is not ideas, but human experience presented as concretely as possible so we can relive it in our imagination. My favorite text for proving this is the story of Cain. In the classroom, I stand before the board and ask the class to name recognizable human experiences in this ancient story. Experiences such as harboring a grudge and attempted cover up a sibling conflict. This list runs to some 20 items. To teach and preach the Bible in keeping with its literary nature requires us to identify the human experiences that are placed before us in the text. 
This takes time, but we can quickly develop a knack of doing it. The payoff is that the voice of authentic human experience will be sounded from the pulpit and Sunday school lectern. The Bible is more than a book of ideas, and the authors of the Bible acknowledged this when they gave us a literary Bible. So they said, what we need to do is like, don't worry about the idea. Find the human experience. Relate the human experience. Hmm. I, I, I don't want to, I always, I always try my best not to be like, I don't want to be super, just immediately reject something. Right. I, I try to, I try to hear it out and I'm trying to think what would that look like in preaching? Do I just simply like here? I mean, let's let, and in this text, do I just, in a sense, take the literary idea of the literary Bible and just go through and find the human experiences and just, What do I just recount the human experiences, retell the human experiences, just try to connect you to that human experience? Because I, I, and maybe, maybe I do view the Bible as a tool to present an idea, or how did he say it? that uh, the Bible is a delivery system for an idea. Maybe I see that all of those human experiences is simply a delivery system to present an idea. Have we so reduced the Bible to just presenting an idea that that's the problem in our preaching because people cannot connect? We're just giving them ideas instead of connecting to the human emotion. And if we can connect them to the human emotion, boom, the sermon becomes interesting, the sermon becomes relevant, and they will remember it. It says, more can be said about what it means that the Bible is predominantly a literary book, but we will have made a good start if we accept this, the subject matter of the literary parts of the Bible as universal, recognizable human experience. We do indeed need to end the journey by articulating the ideas that are implicit in a text. But if we have relived the text as fully as possible, the ideas can be quickly stated. So what we need to spend most of our time is reliving reliving the text. We need to spend more time reliving the text and then we can quickly throw in uh, the ideas. So let we, so preaching should be helping you relive the human experience and then throw in the ideas right at the end. And then boom, now your sermons become interesting, relevant, and life-changing. Now I can hear preachers sitting in some conference, hearing this, writing it down like a hundred miles a second. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this because I feel like my preaching is not effective. I feel like my preaching is not that. I feel like I feel, and, and then, well, then start off getting all like, this is the answer. Now, I'm, I think I'm just going to stop there because we, we're definitely going to come back to this in some way, shape or form. So what do you think? One, what are the ingredients you think are missing? I doubt anyone, I doubt, I doubt anyone sitting in the pew would have been like, the Bible is literature and it needs to be preached in a, based on its literary genre. I don't think anyone would have said that. But is it a situation where the preacher has to figure out what's missing and the people in the pew can't? Or is it because nobody really cares about this and it doesn't really matter? I don't know. But I want to know what you think is missing in preaching. Three things that you think is missing. Three things you think may be missing from the people. Because I, I, don't, I don't think it's always the preaching that is to blame. I think, I think the people sitting in the pew bear great responsibility for why they don't retain, why they don't do anything with it, and why it may feel like church is a waste of time. I, I do believe there's two parties involved here, all right? I don't believe it's one side. But do you believe that preaching sometimes handles the, the Bible as a delivery system for an idea and that we approach every chapter the same and then that's somehow detrimental. And do you think that the goal of preaching is simply to help you relive the human experience in the text and then just throw out the ideas at the end? What, what, would, what would change if, you're, if the sermons were more about helping you relive the human experience? Now, of course, 
when you hear these ideas, you, you kind of, what I, what I, sometimes I find funny is when you hear these new ideas, you hear them, but when you actually hear these ideas implemented in preaching, you, sometimes you kind of look and go, is that really that different? Is that really that unique? It's the same thing that's been done forever. I mean, I, I don't know how many different ways you can change up preaching. I mean, we've tried everything under the sun. I, I just think that when it comes down to it, you got a text, you got to, try to get the text to the people. I, I don't know how many different ways. I think, I think sometimes we just try to dress. We're just changing the clothing. I don't think we're really changing the ultimate, ultimately what preaching is. I think we just dress it up differently and then everyone feels like we've, we've found some new ways. Now, I haven't read the book. Again, the name of the book is The Beauty and Power of Biblical Exposition. Maybe I'll place it on my list of other books, uh, in my list of books that I need to get to. But maybe we'll come back to this. I think I did a good, a good enough job in trying to get us there, okay? Um, I think I messed up modicum or moda. I can't remember. There's some word I messed up somewhere in there, but uh, hopefully hopefully that didn't uh, distract you at all. A modicum? I can't remember which word it was, but I'm not going to go back to the article. But there you have it. Three things you think are missing. I really want to hear from you. I really, 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 really do. Really do. Because it, the people in the pew, they never want to speak up sometimes. They, they'll speak up when they probably shouldn't speak up and argue when they shouldn't argue. But then when they're begged to speak up, they won't speak up. It's really bizarre. Okay. But I, 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 think, I think all preachers need to hear what the person in the pew think is missing. But I think the people in the pew need to be honest about what, what could they do? What's missing in them? And then I really just want you to think about this, that... Do you feel that preaching would be radically different and better if preaching was more to help you relive the human experience of the, st- of the text and then throw in the ideas at the end? In other words, the ideas are secondary to you reliving the human experience. All right, email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com newsif at yahoo.com. I know it's Labor Day weekend. Historically, as a podcaster, I know that if I do lots of live broadcasting during the holiday weekend, that the numbers will be absolutely in the garbage can. They will be in the dumpster because people have got other things they're doing. They're hanging out with friends or whatever people do. They're going to go be doing things. So um, I always get nervous uh, because I'm like, I can spend a lot of time doing so. But I think what I'm going to do is whenever I have something, I'm just going to come up here and turn on the microphone. And if you're around and want to listen, great. And if you don't, hopefully maybe by Monday or Tuesday, whenever things go back to normal for you after the, the long weekend, you'll have plenty of things to choose from. But typically what happens is then on Tuesday, I'm already moving on. So people are already behind. And then they say, just forget it. I'll just start with where he is. So then I do all of those episodes and did it really, see, I can sit there and overanalyze it all day. So I think I'm just going to do what I want to do. And if it benefits someone, great. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Really, if you think about it, that's really how it is with preaching. You can come up with every, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't critique and analyze and think, but ultimately there's very little control in what we accomplish, I think, especially from a spiritual standpoint. All we can do is speak it, teach it, be accurate to it. And I don't, I mean, I don't know what else in some, I think we can come up with every theory and method in the, in the world. And I, I just, I just don't know. I mean, it kind of goes back to this preaching to be done to the, the, in a sense, in man's wisdom, the wisdom of, of what we can come up with, our new techniques, our new, I mean, I'm not saying we should, should ignore all of that. I just think that ultimately the spiritual good that comes from preaching is out of our hands. It's out of our control. I know that sounds like a, a neglecting responsibility, but. Yeah, you can, you can let me know what you think. All right, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. And we, we're, we're going to try to get to a Glenn Beck program. Uh, I'm going to try to that aired this week where, hey, how the left is basically destroying the Bible. And uh, it just, I always find it interesting that we never mention how the right is mishandling and destroying the Bible. But okay, so we, we will definitely try to listen to a little bit of that, review that. We've got the... Uh, we got the sermons from the youth conference in Indiana to get back to, and I'm going to try to dedicate a whole bunch of time to the uh, imitation of Christ. I haven't forgotten that. Um, and then, of course, we've got Amos to work on. We always have so many different things. But, and, and I have not forgotten the Frankfurt Declaration 
Um, I've been watching how other people are responding to the declaration. Um, I did not receive a lot of emails about the Frankfurt Declaration. I really thought I was going to. Like, but wait, wait, this is great. This is great. I, I received the one, but I don't think I've received many more about it. Um, I, I think it's a pretty important subject, and I, but we'll see. I, I saw lots of podcasters who've got plans to address it maybe next week. I don't know why it takes them that long to address it. I, just turn on the microphone and start talking, but I digress. Um, we'll see if you, if you see discussion or articles about the Frankfurt declaration, let me know because, uh, I'm just interested in how much time I should dedicate to it or has it already been like whatever and everyone's already moved on. Is it even really, is it, is it going to have literally no significance to anyone other than the people who wrote it so that they can say, we wrote a declaration. <laughs> is, does it mean anything to anyone else? That that's, that's going to be the interesting thing, but we'll see. All right, email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Whatever you do, wherever you go this weekend, I hope you have a great time. I hope you're safe. And, um, well, hopefully you can make some time for, well, the study of God's word, maybe listening to a Christian podcast, and, of course, church on Sunday. Thanks for listening. God bless.